Eyes will see what the uh, uh, what the brain knows, right? So once you start seeing them, once once we wanted to do workshops, we'd see tons of places coming to us. If we were not interested, nobody would come. So admissions for CLI have also increased, and CLI patients have come to us with more and more complex comorbidities. Renal disease is one of the commonest things that we see. Our patients. Average creatinine is normally 1.5, and that is always something that we have to deal with. And they are always high, high mobility, high mortality patients. And the treatment of patients with PAD has two important goals, always to reduce the extremely high mortality and mobility that is associated with this condition. And secondly, the, to prevent amputation, improve symptoms of claudication, and improve overall quality of life. I think the most important thing is mobility and mortality because they're carrying so many comorbids, but it is also important that you prevent a, a life, not a life, sometimes a life threatening and sometimes just a quality of life threatening amputations. And the serious problems to deal with are always death, gangrene, limb salvage, pain, and then of course, non-healing ulcers. And these, this is where uh, interventionists come in. And I always put up this slide because I like it as an orchestra and it is now part of the guidelines also that you need so many people here, the interventionist, the vascular surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon or slash general, sur general surgeon, the diabetes person, the physician, the radiologist, the nephrologist, uh, and not to forget the podiatrist. And I think that is such an important thing because in the end, people don't really care what you did inside the cath lab. They want to see what's going on with the foot and uh, somebody who can actually fix their foot, can actually give them a good, uh, 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 nice prosthesis even because whatever your interventions, you may still end up with uh, amputations. I think you should familiarize yourself with for lower extremity disease and ESC actually calls it lead, uh, lower extremity disease, whereas uh, PAD is the American terminology. So there are two main classifications, Fontaine classification and the Rutherford classification. I often use the Rutherford classification, I find that more uh, clinical. But so, uh, so you have asymptomatic, mild claudication, moderate claudication, and severe claudication. From here onwards is where the interventionist will come in with severe claudication. When otherwise these people, the asymptomatic and the mild to moderate claudicans should be treated medically and conservatively. Exercise walk is their best options. And then from Rutherford grade one to severe claudication three, four, five, and six with minor tissue loss and then major tissue loss. Uh, this is a classification that came up a few years ago, and it is an extremely useful one. It is the Wi-Fi classification, uh, the wound ischemia and foot infection. If patients come in with a wound, which is ischemic, as well as with foot infections, and if the local infections are more than skin and subcutaneous tissue, enforcing a systemic inflammatory response as well, or there are extensive deep ulcers or full thickness heel ulcers, et cetera. Basically, if the higher the score, the risk of amputation still remains. The interesting thing about this is that people, one feels by and large, you will fix a non-healing ulcer. But once, but if you do this classification, you will have, you can counsel your patient that I can fix your uh, uh, I can fix your lesions but you may still end up with some kind of amputation because this actually gives us an idea about how much is the risk of amputation at one year for each combination so it is extremely important to fix the wound and infection as well as the ischemia in that uh, area. And then of course, there is the treatment of the wound. So in the end, because we see very late cases, we end up having a lot of ischemia, a lot of, uh, we still have a lot of amputations, but you actually change the level of amputation. But these are the couple of uh, 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 classifications that I think you should have in your uh, cath lab so that you can actually judge and it helps 
to counsel your patients. We do a lot of counseling before we do interventions. And actually, but it is important because at the end, they will still, they can blame you that, look, we did so much, we spent so much, and uh, we went through so much morbidity and we still ended up with an amputation. This is the task uh, uh, classification also, but this is more uh, now, uh, and if you can, uh, it just gives you the severity of anatomical severity of lesions and their placements. However, nowadays they are not looking at this classification a lot and uh, uh, the ESC seems to have uh, gotten rid of it almost. So these were the last guidelines that I could come up with, uh, which were the ESC guidelines. The AHA guidelines were uh, for, from 2016. And what was new about that is that they seem to want, and we'll talk about lower extremity disease basically, and I'm not going to focus on carotid and uh, because that's a separate issue altogether. And Numan had asked me to talk about subclavians and renals also, but they also require their own, uh, uh, their own uh, session. So um, uh, if we can expand into the peripheral territory. So uh, they, in, by, in 2011, uh, they used to only talk about primary endovascular therapy, but now they want to talk about, they are suggesting surgery in the aorto ileic segments as well, uh, but however, endovascular is an alternative. And the interesting thing that they are talking about is for infrapopliteal lesions is surgery for infrapopliteal lesions and endovascular therapy. Let me tell you that our vascular surgeons, in my experience, and um, if there is a vascular surgeon around on the uh, uh, in the audience, they feel free to speak up because they do not do infrapopliteal lesions. And in fact, people have gone away from even doing fempop bypasses or actually good bypasses in the leg as well. So we are doing more and more endovascular therapy because that is the only thing that really helps our patient because nobody will do an infrapopliteal bypass for them using a saphenous vein graft. Uh, what else? Uh, of course, statins and uh, uh, are, statins are are absolutely necessary, and people who are natural fibrillation should be anticoagulated. And geography in CLTI, CLTI is critical limb, limb threatening ischemia with below the lean lesions, and in and they have put in a triple A uh, duplex screening in case of patients with cabbage. They want to, uh, and if people have a, a positive ABI, they suggest limiting vein harvesting, which is a good thought and uh, again uh, they all they want all coronary artery disease patients to be screened for lower extremity disease and in heart failure patients and clobetagel is preferred over aspirin in these uh, so and and always i always do a screening for heart failure for my patients and uh, and even for uh, and they su suggest that if people have stable pads then anticoagulation alone rather than an antiplatelet so the new revised concept is that of a vascular team, the orchestra I talked about earlier, best medical therapy, which is drugs and non-pharmacological interventions for optimal outcomes. And then mask disease should be individualized from asymptomatic disease and modern management of claudication involves statins and there is a, a supervised exercise therapy. And how, it must be underlined again and again how important exercise therapy is. Just like cardiac rehab, you must have leg rehab. In this context, the vasoactive drugs use that sometimes you see over here is, is quite uncertain. CLTI defines the most severe form of, uh, uh, of, of disease and beyond ischemia, the new Wi-Fi classification uh, should, be, uh, will, should be used to stratify the amputation risk. The task classification has been excluded from the guidelines. And then you must screen for other conditions like heart failure and atrial fibrillation. I feel that if you find thrombus, look for atrial fibrillation. What we have done is, in, uh, I, what I have sometimes done is I've had thrombus in this SFA, in both the SFAs and the patient is in sinus rhythm and has had a, uh, and has had a, 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 an anormal echo. Nothing, no mitral valve, no LV dysfunction, no, no nothing. But I have put frequent halters on them and found atrial fibrillation there. And I have treated them with anticoagulation and they have done well. And of course, revascularized the SFAs and removed a huge, big uh, uh, amounts of thrombus from there. So that is a tip that if you find a normal heart and, uh, uh, and, and sinus rhythm, still keep looking for atrial fibrillation, which is very common. And particularly if you have thrombotic lesions, they're obviously coming from somewhere. Look for triple A if you are looking at the elderly, uh, 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 elderly age group.
So revascularizing. Uh, so these are some of the guidelines of uh, 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 suggesting which patient should be done endovascularly. And uh, essentially, aorto iliacs you do endovascularly for short lesions, and they can be considered for long lesions as well. Those who are fit, you can send them. However, even if those who are unfit, you should do them yourself as endovascular. Uh, primary stent implantation for iliacs is the better uh, option, and sometimes you can have a hybrid uh, 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 hybrid techniques as well, combining them with bypass. For fempop lesions, less than 25 centimeter endovascular first is class one. Everything else is class two. You can use uh, a primary stent implantation for short lesions. You're, we will come back to the stents to understand why we do not want to put too many stents in the fempop uh, lesions. And for, uh, long, uh, you can use drug eluting balloons, drug eluting stents, and uh, drug eluting balloons also for instant restenosis. Patients who are not at high risk for surgery, bypass surgery can be uh, is class one indication and uh, for more than 25 centimeter lesions. However, uh, uh, you can still for uh, do uh, endovascular therapy in long fempop lesions. Again, as I said earlier, I am now doing more than uh, uh, more than 25 centimeter lesions for fempop also because now people are reluctant to undergo surgery. And in case of CLTI, infrapop revascularization, class one uh, uh, indication. Again, for, re, uh, for infrapop, class one appears to be the great saphenous vein for surgery. But here we are doing endovascular therapy for uh, infrapopliteal vessels. The FEMPOP segment is the most commonly treated infraenguinal culprit in patients presenting with symptomatic peripheral arterial disease. Revascularization is indicated for lifestyle limiting claudication after exhaustive, exhausting non-invasive measures and in CLTI. The decision regarding surgical or endovascular re revascularization relies on comprehensive evaluation of both anatomic and patient characteristics. And today, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, technological advances have allowed an endovascular first approach in increasingly complex lesions. I think it's important to understand the FEMPOP uh, uh, landscape and to understand the stresses that are being uh, uh, taken uh, by, uh, uh, by the FEMPOP region. So we start initially from vascular access, we move on to devices, and then we will go on to future directions. So if you look at vascular access, and uh, there can be multiple kinds, anti-grade as well as retrograde. Anti-grade can be radial, contralateral femoral, ipsilateral common femoral, and ipsilateral SFA. Retrograde can be from the distal superficial femoral, from the popliteals, from the tibials, and then from the we have, of, we have sometimes even used the peroneal, not just the anterior and the posterior tibial. And then there is, like any other angioplasty, there is vessel preparation and the lesion treatment. And of course, there is intra-arterial imaging. So for vessel preparation, again, like any other artery, you can do atherectomy, specialty balloons, which can be scoring, cutting, chocolate balloons, intravascular lithotripsy. Everything is used in the peripherals. What we use? We do not have this equipment, but we try. Uh, lesion treatments by plain balloons, which is always our mainstay. And then there are drug coated balloons with Paclitaxel and Sirolimus. And these are sometimes available in our centers. Bare metal stents, which are both we have used self expanding and nitinol woven, and uh, as well as, uh, uh, as balloon mounted. And drug eluting stents, the drugs can be Paclitaxel, and they're now coming up with Everolimus, Sirolimus, Amphilimus, and then there are covered stents for specific reasons. And then for imaging, you can use intravascular ultrasound. What are the future directions? There are many other devices that are coming up and maybe, and there is, uh, I will talk about them in detail uh, in a little while. I just wanted to sh uh, share with all of you that in Pakistan, the game changer for peripheral arterial disease, some basic tools and skill sets that we learned a little over 15 years ago. In these 15 years, we have seen increasing awareness in our patient population and in our professional colleagues on how to deal with this very sick patient cohort. Most importantly, I think people have started to learn who to refer to rather than do a life shattering amputation. Uh, 
And for me, the game changer was vascular access. When we discovered the crossover or destination sheet, which was specifically made to cross over into the uh, uh, into contralateral artery, and it acted as a guider and support, which we could never do. We used to use coronary equipment, and we used to get stuck like anything. And I think it is extremely important to understand, do not use coronary material for these accesses. Use dedicated uh, sheets and, uh, and, and equipment, and you will have a good success. Uh, then we, uh, we ipsilateral integrate access for below knee intervention because we do not have these very long catheters. So we have to work accordingly. And ipsilateral integrate access actually gave us good, uh, 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 good use of the SFA. And then you could, you, you could deal with distal SFA, POP, and, and uh, the rest of the tibial uh, tree uh, down below the knee. And, and for us, the game changer eventually became retrograde pedal access, which we learned both with ultrasound guidance as well as with uh, floral guidance. And my suggestion to young people and everyone else who wants to do this is learn ultrasound guidance. Use your radials with ultrasound, use your femorals with ultrasound and learn because that really helps you with uh, your retrograde uh, pedal access. And wherever you want to access, learn ultrasound uh, with it. And, and then of course came in the, the era of the support catheters just like in the coronaries but they're really very very helpful in the peripheral where you have the glide catheters which you have seen intra uh, uh, you've seen the ir people use them and then there are other micro catheters which were also they, they give a lot of support and have some penetrating power also like rubicon and cxi so these are the crossover sheets I just wanted to show you and how they help in crossing over into the arch. Very difficult arches can also be maneuvered and there are tips and tricks to maneuver through with uh, sometimes uh, with, uh, with heavier wires and with, with stiff wires and of course uh, sometimes with uh, balloon supports as well. Uh, and you can actually change the shape of the, of the crossover sheet as well according to the, uh, how you see as a picture. Let me also remind you that my first go to investigation for these people is a CT angiogram. And I do not waste a lot of time with Doppler ultrasounds unless there is a huge contraindication with creatinine. 1.5 creatinine does not bother us. And then there are some of the support catheters which are available here. I've shown these because these are the ones that are available. Otherwise, they can be quite a few. And these are the Rubicon, and which is Boston Scientific, and CXI, which is Cook. Cook is very helpful with... Uh, um, with these. Then the game changes for us basic simple techniques. The world has moved on and they are on to specialty wires. And they are 0.18 and, and, and the CTO wires of 1.4 with, with, uh, with different kinds of weights to up, right up to 30, 40 grams. However, considering our uh, situation, we do most of our stuff with the 0.35 stiff shaft glide wires and uh, uh, or the, but essentially 0.35 wires and the below knee stuff with the 0.14. We love using the 0.18 specialty wires especially the V18, but uh, uh, it is uh, uh, you sometimes, uh, in fact, quite frequently cannot be made available. Balloons, I think, essentially made a huge difference to us when we learned that long length 200 millimeter balloons, uh, 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 up to 200 millimeter balloons can be used because they give you a nice, uh, it actually uh, doesn't, you don't spend so much time there also because you have to consider. In the beginning, we used to spend three or four hours with one patient and fluoro time was huge, sometimes more than a hundred minutes. It's, and, and it is bad for the patient, bad for you, and bad for the machine and the rest of the staff. So with, with the advent of these uh, new equipments and their availability, it became much easier. And then the scaffolds that we use are drug eluting stents like bacitexel coated. Uh, they also helped uh, uh, ISR and covered stents saved lives, which I will show you in a minute. So well-known, let's talk about, let's start from the beginning and uh, uh, we have uh, access sites issues. Well-known complications of femoral arterial access, you all know, local hematomas, pseudoaneurysm, and retroperitoneal bleeding. And additionally, the presence of PAD is associated always because these are very friable vessels with an increased risk of access site complication. And although the use of ultrasound guidance has helped us, uh, however, even then complication rates remain very high between 3.5 to 11%. Hence, other access sites like pedal and radial are gradually gaining popularity. 
So what are the devices? We just talked about plain balloons, drug-coated balloons, bare metal stents, drug-eluting stents, covered stents, atherectomy devices, specialty balloons, and intravascular ultrasound. So what is plain old balloon angioplasty? It has a high technical success rate ranging from 98% to 100%, but frequent complications in the FEMPOP region includes residual stenosis, vessel recoil, and flow-limiting dissections, and which may require bailout stenting. It plays a role in primary vascularization with provisional stenting, but it, it is often used as, as an adjunct to other devices. You can uh, uh, use them, uh, they can be performed with provisional stenting in limited disease, less than 100 millimeter. Uh, but however, a failure of plain balloon angioplasty necessitates stent placement. This is in accordance with contemporary appropriate use criteria, which grade the use of plain balloon angioplasty is appropriate for less than 100 and may be appropriate for lesions more than 100. Practically speaking, we do balloon angioplasties for all. If you do not have a flow limiting dissection, you leave it as such, it is much better because stents have a higher uh, instant restenosis rate. However, and I'll just show you a diagram which will tell us why the SFA se uh, segment restenosis. However, with the new stents like the Zilver stent or the Supera stent, you have better results. Uh, but how? So short focal lesions and no stent preferred uh, 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 strategy. The primary issue is uh, poor rates of long-term patency because it will bounce back. So bare metal stents are self-expanding nitinol stents. So it's a nickel titanium. Nitinol is a nickel titanium alloy with thermal shape memory and super elasticity that allows for recovery of shape. And it is, gives you improved patency when treating lesions more than 100 millimeter. Limitations, as we stent, said, is high rates of restenosis with if you put in more than 100 millimeter length of stent and stent fractures. And why do they fracture? They have torsional forces here. They have elongation and compression in this section. And then there's flexion and extension. So you need a lot of radial strength for these. So then uh, uh, we'll come back to the stents again. And uh, just to mention the drug coated balloons that arrived with paclitaxel coated devices, and they gave us good uh, uh, results. However, Theoretical concerns remained about paclitaxel distal embolization and their safety. So new generation of, uh, at the, however, as I mentioned about the stents, you have Supera, and then there is another new one, Biomimics. We unfortunately do not have the Supera stent here, but this is not a drug-coated stent. It's a BMS, but it has a nitinol woven reticular design, and it showed a markedly low rate of stent fracture. So that was used, uh, that has been used in uh, to treat complex lesions, including long lesions, heavy calcification, and distal SFA. Then there is another new one, which is purpose-built vascular scaffold biomimics, which has a helical center line and is designed to minimize shear stress. That all has also shown uh, a, a lot of good results. Then we had Zilver stent and the Alluvia stent, which was the Paclitaxel based. And there was a lot of conversation about Paclitaxel uh, causing uh, uh, high morbidity for some reason. However, that has now been put aside about the safety of Paclitaxel coated device. And there was some concern about aneurysmal degeneration late. There have been some limus based antiproliferative agents which have less vascular toxicity. But however, uh, they are still uh, uh, in the development stage and there are some which are amphilimus based devices and then there are covered stents which have been used for to treat uh, long lesions which do not have a lot of vessels in uh, uh, in between however there is an increased uh, risk of stent thrombosis and my use of covered stents is mainly uh, in the eyelids and then there are atherectomy devices just like any other, uh, uh, they can be used wherever uh, but they reduce inflation pressures with angioplasty to limit dissections and they improve the results of PTA. What kind of atherectomy devices? I think we have rotational atherectomy in our country. So that is something that can be used, which is the rota link now. And then there is orbital atherectomy. There's directional atherectomy like the silver hawk, turbo hawk. Hawk one and pantherus. And this is something that is not present in our country. The one laser atherectomy, and I think there is laser atherectomy, Asim Javed might bear me up that they have laser uh, atherectomy devices in their center. Uh, and somewhere else also in Pakistan, they are using that. Uh, the one that I have uh, seen and being used here in Lahore, uh, somebody brought it over was the Debra device. 
uh, and then which is what this looked like and it does not use a wire and can be uh, can be sent through thrombus and isr then there are specialty balloons like scoring balloons cutting balloons and chocolate balloons i've had we have had we can use all of them they should be peripherally peripheral uh, uh, dedicated balloons and uh, there is one colleague uh, Khusra Niazi who actually swears by chocolate balloons and says I do not use rota or anything in fact just a chocolate balloon is fine uh, to prepare the vessel it induces fractures in plaque and calcium moderate to severe and as a result it reduces inflation pressures with angioplasty to limit dissections and improve results of PTA however there is limited uh, data so what it looks like, because this is the interesting device and can perhaps easily be used without too much equipment, uh, is that uh, it has a, a nitinol cage, uh, uh, it has, it's a nitinol caged balloon. And as the balloon inflates, the cage causes the balloon to form a series of segmented pillows and grooves along the entire lesion. The pillows apply force to create small dissections that are necessary for effective dilatation. The grooves relieve the stress and stop dissections from propagating. And there's the famous intravascular lithotripsy, which we all know is being used quite frequently in the coronaries. The same principle applies and is being used in the peripherals as well. And it also provides uh, 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 invasive intraluminal, uh, uh, sorry, intravascular ultrasound will then provide intraluminal imaging, which provides cross-sectional vascular representation like any other in the coronaries and will improve characterization and plaque characteristics. It, the important thing is that uh, we need to always understand what the morphology is to, to be able to predict what uh, the results of our intervention are going to be. And so intravascular ultrasound is helpful. Again, adds to the cost of the procedure and these are very costly procedures. What are future directions? So much is happening. Novel antiproliferative compounds are coming up, lipophilic nanocarriers and amphiphilic serolimus based formulations, uh, uh, adventitial delivery of dexamethasone, they're thinking about steroid, may have future clinical utility and stop the development of new intimal hyperplasia, development of bio resorbable scaffolds for vessel support, just like in the coronaries. So over time, complete resorption of the polymer will allow recovery of normal fempop vasomotion, decreasing late risks, including instant restenosis. And then I thought this is a really interesting uh, way of doing this that you can do a vein graft, uh, a vein graft basically percutaneously, which involves the use of the ipsilateral femoral vein to place covered stent grafts as a conduit bypassing the SFA lesion. There's a detour two trial going on, which will help us uh, with these future directions. And the current state of fempop revascularization allows for an endovascular approach to address most PAD lesions, regardless of the clinical syndrome, reserving surgery for special cases or refractory lesions. And this is what I was saying earlier, that now that the vascular surgeons are stepping back from these, particularly the infra pops, uh, and, and I do not see that much good results with FEMPOP uh, uh, bypasses. And there is improved patency rates, rapid recovery times, as compared to surgery, it allows uh, them to be an almost an OPD procedure. We keep them overnight. Uh, newer technologies have come in and a general philosophy of leave the, the least behind with regards to stenting have shown significant improvement in procedural technical success rates and freedom from TLR and the need for stent implantation. And now this is what we are beginning to do. We leave the least behind uh, and, and stent shorter segments, uh, only those that we consider are flow limiting or have bounced back otherwise, and we have reasonably good results from that. Newer stent technologies are helping us now and perhaps bioresorbable scaffolds and novel antiproliferative technologies will overcome the challenges of complex FEMPOP artery disease. I would suggest that the fellows and, and everyone else read this uh, article from Sky uh, uh, Journal, which uh, is uh, which really helps, uh, which is actually very, very uh, gives you an up update on uh, whatever uh, the current devices are. They may be philosophical for us, but one must always know the state of the art. I think this is where I'll stop my talk, but I have a few cases and if Numan allows me, I'll show them uh, over the next five minutes and then we can have questions uh, about it. So uh, please continue and finish the cases as well. How much more time for the cases? Uh, five minutes, you said? Five minutes, five to seven okay. minutes. And then we can have sure, sure. So once you're done with the cases, then we can have a uh, discussion. We, uh, yeah.
Yeah. We will have about 20 minutes for discussion. We can have that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, this is a 49-year-old male. He was a receptionist at one of our very famous uh, uh, and senior professors, uh, my principal at King Edward Medical College. And he uh, presented with history of sudden onset pain. Actually, that pain had happened. Uh, the, the case is done uh, much later, but that pain had happened and uh, he didn't go anywhere. And then he came back much later, a month or so, that he still has that pain. And he has been having difficulty in walking and his walking distance was 50 meter, no wounds. And his, uh, he was in Rutherford one, grade three, basically, because his, he, so this was severe, he was a severe claudicant. We brought him uh, to we brought him to the cath lab. I don't have his CTs because I always get a CT done, and it was decided. Uh, um, I'll just show you his pictures. Uh, that this is what his SFA looked like, and there was nothing much below knee. So this is what actually the uh, the CT also looked like. I, I love my CTs because they're actually very representative of uh, what we find in the angiogram. And the people that we started to work with, the radiologists, they give us very nice pictures. So we decided to take a left femoral ipsilateral anti-grade approach. And we also did a pedal uh, wire, a micro puncture set. And the wires that were finally used were fielder FC, stiff glide, soft glide, Crossover sheath uh, from Cook was also taken. However, uh, uh, actually, uh, we did not uh, eventually uh, use the crossover sheath. And then a microcatheter quick cross was used and some balloons uh, of uh, different sizes, five, three, and four. And this is how, uh, this is what it looked like. It actually got wired quite easily through the SFA and right into the tibials with the help of the microcatheter and we got to this point. Then it was basically just a case of ballooning. This is what the below knee looked like. There was only one vessel going through that. And we just ballooned everything, as you can see over here. So I'll quickly run through it because this, these are long processes. It takes a long time to get them done. So balloons everywhere. For whatever reason, we had an 80 millimeter balloon, so that's all that we used. And lo and behold, we have a reasonable access down to the tibials. So next. This is what we got. There is a little bit of dissection that you can see. And uh, so we thought we got a reasonable result. We, we can see some tibials. Uh, and uh, so we thought that we could wire this anti-gradely. However, we couldn't wire it. Uh, we tried, we tried multiple times. It wouldn't go, it would only go in that direction. And then perhaps there was a, there was a CTO here for the anterior tibial. The wire is a fielder XD, going in the wrong direction. It looks very nice, but it isn't. I was creating more dissections. So you can see there's a lot of resistance there. So we come retrogradely. So retrogradely, this is a micropuncture set and you can use that, it's expensive. So in the end today, we just use our regular uh, radial set essentially, and we put in a six branch uh, in the tibials. Uh, but if you can, you can see that from the top, we are not in the right. Uh, but we use floral guidance, so we are already accessed from the uh, from anti grade. You can actually inject and at the same time uh, uh, try uh, the PV. So, this is floral guided, right? but the vessel is, uh, but the wire still does not go. This is our early learning experience, but it is difficult, right? So you think that you've got the wire in, but it's not there. So you must guide accordingly. This will now just go through. So you can see that this has gone in. So now it's uh, uh, sticking at the, uh, at the CTO side. I don't have a picture in which it goes through, but it does go through. 
And then we just balloon, balloon, and balloon. We've got a bit of the section there. Balloon, balloon. How about the big guys? You do not have uh, you do not have a good picture for the uh, for the distal uh, ATA because uh, uh, you have sheets down below, right? But you had a good outflow here. This patient now has bounding pulses down below, and he is uh, brilliant. He can walk whatever, and uh, I still see him. This is now a couple of years ago, and uh, he's walking around and he has no problems. Then we have another patient who was in with a four one grade three severe intermittent claudication, and he's diabetic and a smoker. Uh, we and uh, I again initial pictures are not there, but there was a tight stenosis of the proximal left common iliac artery. It was followed by calcified and totally occluded long segment of the left external iliac artery. This is how we accessed him from the right uh, 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 contralateral side. There was nothing much uh, from uh, here, so. Uh, the, the interesting thing for this is really that because there was a tight stenosis over here, one could not get the crossover sheath across it. So we opted to balloon this first, stent it first, and then get our equipment down so that we can fix the rest of the eyelids. So we ballooned it. Uh, it was a tight stenosis here. I could not somehow uh, upload the first picture, which actually gives a very nice picture of this. And then we put in a stent. And this is a balloon mounted stent. At the ostiums or nearby, we put balloon mounted stent. Imal used to say that you should put in a covered stent in this area so that you don't worry about any uh, perforation. And however, we use what we have. We keep a covered stent always with us on the shelf because the risk of perforation eyelids, particularly if they are calcified, is quite high. So we went on to uh, to go down, and you can see that the tip of the of the guide gat, the the uh, of the sheath is over here, and this is the nub of the external eyelid. This huge big vessel is the internal eyelid, which has grown so big to provide collaterals. There's a total occlusion of the eyelid. And you cannot see the femorals. Why do we know the femorals are there? Because he is a claudicant and his CT shows that the femorals are there. So we know that we, will, we should be able to access it. And we do. We wire it, we get into the SFA and we balloon. Uh, now keep looking at everything and, and you will see what happens here. And keep looking at the bladder also. Uh, and we put in a stent, which is a, uh, uh, a self-expanding stent and we get a reasonable result. Now we think that it is too small for an eyelid, so we build it up and we do our post dilatation and we get a nice result over we're happy. But lo and behold, the patient uh, screams a little bit and he, um, and he drops his blood pressure to 30 systolic. So if you look back at what has happened, you can see that there is a leak over here. And we, his blood pressure drops to 30 systolic. He almost rests, but I think we kept our cool. Uh, took, uh, uh, to, because the, uh, it, was a, it was not, a, uh, it was a balloon. Uh, we uh, did a balloon tamponade here, and then we took that out. And immediately we had a covered stent. We took, uh, we brought in a covered stent, and we placed it over here. We first did the balloon tamponade right there and then, and uh, took back the balloon in. Sometimes not easy to put in big balloons, right? So, and then we put in a covered stent over here. And have a look at the bladder. The bladder has dented from here, and that's why I said always, once you're here, you can always keep looking at the bladder. Now it has dented a bit. Because it's free. And you can see more dense, which you call the bladder sign over here. However, we uh, checked it again and there was no further leak. Patient's blood pressure came up. And this is what the rest of his blood vessels look like. So this is just to tell you that uh, this, is, uh, this uh, procedure can be a life threatening procedure. 
and uh, we can uh, uh, get into a lot of trouble if you don't think on your toes and you do not have the right equipment on the shelf, just like any other coronary that you are doing, because ileaks are inside the vessel, inside the body. You cannot put a tourniquet on them. You have to have these covered stents with you. Uh, I can stop here, Numan. And there I think it's a good idea so that we have some time yeah. for uh, discussion. Interesting yeah. case, so the last case you're showing, excellent talk, first of all, uh, very comprehensive and uh, for uh, lower extremity, covered essentially everything. And uh, nice to share your cases as well. Last case you were showing for the ileaks, you know, whenever I'm going up on the balloon over there, I'm asking the patient if you're feeling any pain or stretch, that's a good sign he's going to, now if you go beyond that, he's going to perf your vessel. So, um, you know, so yeah, the, without the covered stent, um, uh, um, you know, ileic interventions are always a problem because they bleed out very fast and, uh, um, you know, and, and you can lose them on the table. So very important uh, learning point from that case. Um, you know, uh, I guess, just for discussion generation, uh, I, you know, we all ordered Doppler and uh, CT, um, but, you know, we used to have a, 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 in US a PBL recording, which is good physiologic information that we had tracings. And then you had the ABIs of each level segment of the artery in the lower extremities. Um, so uh, somehow we haven't been able to do them over here. I don't know why. It doesn't require too much technical skill. Just need to train a few people to be able to do it. I mean, there were... Uh, well-trained technicians who used to do it over there. We just used to review the reports in the end, but that is something which hasn't come up. And uh, the other point I wanted to make was that, you know, even if you're not doing peripheral interventions, the people who are not interested in peripheral interventions, it's important to have those skills. When I was uh, starting my training back, uh, interventional training after a fellowship in 2005, my cabinet sector said, you must do all the peripheral thing very seriously because, you know, even if you focus on coronary structural, you need to have those peripheral skills to bail yourself out. We need to be able to, all of us interventions, deal with the vascular excess site complications, you know? Um, so those skills are a must. And uh, uh, with the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, and I'll go further for discussion to the uh, other discussants who are out there. I think Asim is with us. Dr. Asim Jawed. Yes, Numan, I'm here. Ji, Hazur, kya hai, khariyat se? So Asim is also a great resource. You know, I've done a few cases where I've messaged him as well and, you know, to plan out the whole inventory and send him the images and stuff. So uh, along with Dr. Amber as well. Um, so it's always important for peripherals. You know, you have three wire options. You have uh, different catheter length options, different sheath options and their length options. So with the equipment availability being scarce, it's good to have a discussion among those who are doing routinely and plan out the procedure in advance since the CT imaging gives you a lot of information to plan the procedure in advance and uh, get all the measurements beforehand. So ask him any thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Noman. And first of all, let me congratulate Dr. Amber for such a brilliant talk. And uh, I really appreciate the initiative that you took. She's one of the, I think, pioneers in peripheral interventions in Pakistan. And it's a it's an area which really has a huge unmet need. Um, and she's done a wonderful job. Um, commenting on the inventory, I think it's a huge inventory for peripheral as compared to the coronaries. And you've got three main platforms, as Madam Amber has uh, very nicely shown. And everything then further goes on from 035, 018, 014. Then you've got different balloons with monorail over the wire. Then you've got different shaft lengths for each one of them. Uh, so it's a huge inventory to maintain. So what we've done at RIC is that we've uh, eliminated 018 from our inventory. So we've limited everything to 035 and 014 based platforms. The other thing is we've eliminated the monorail systems and we've kept only the over the wire uh, balloons, over the wire stands, and we've maintained only the longest length and uh, shaft length in each one of them. That's the only way of curtailing your inventory. Otherwise, it is a huge inventory to maintain. That, yeah, those, those, uh, because I often uh, um, uh, liken it to a superstore like you go and you have so many different kind of cereals you just do not know what to buy right and that's the kind of inventory that sometimes you are faced with uh, in uh, in the cath lab for this well i think it makes it easier for all of us because of the lack of availability of stuff uh, yeah that's true as well 
Uh, but that, that's a good thought to just go with a 300 centimeter wire and go with an over the wire for everything, uh, you know, um, yeah, exactly. as Asim has done to simplify things, in, especially doing a purchase and in government setup and, you know, uh, and ordering a lot of stuff uh, to um, have that uh, option as well. Um, do we have Dr. Jabbar here with us? Uh, uh, yeah, from, uh, I'm here, Dr. Numan. Thank you very much. Yes, any Thank thoughts? Uh, Jabbar, you want to share your experiences? Yeah. Uh, first of all, congratulations to PSIC by starting this uh, peripheral and wonderful presentation by uh, Professor Amber. And uh, she, uh, I think, covered everything. Uh, I will agree with Dr. Asim, we have to uh, curtail our uh, inventory according to the need. Uh, uh, what he's doing, uh, I think uh, I'm doing the same. Uh, I have kept the longest uh, balloon uh, available and I'm using this uh, nano cross pound cook, which is cheaper as compared to the other and uh, ever cross and uh, different wire uh, mainly 300 and o18 uh, we are not using it uh, uh, actually we don't have it and uh, we, we we are having difficulty but what uh, i want to emphasize uh, uh, we have discussed in park live as well uh, the the one thing which is very much neglected is acute limb ischemia uh, we don't have you know, the uh, in our hospital nowadays we have started the uh, TPS, TSP would uh, give uh, streptokinase, uh, which would uh, cause more complication, more bleeding. So we have to focus uh, in, in the peripheral and uh, we have to create awareness by uh, doing such uh, sessions and uh, doing more workshop. Dr. Asim has already started and uh, I'm planning uh, uh, after the, the EU we'll do it uh, similar workshop in Peshawar as well. So the, this is uh, an unmet uh, need, and uh, we have to focus on it. And uh, congratulations to PSIC and Professor Ambar and, and, uh, her wonderful also. And the, you know, I have to say this: the Jabbar was actually complaining that we have been having a lot of sessions, a lot of talks, but we are missing out. We haven't had a peripheral one, so the, you know that's why we kept this and uh, decided to go ahead with it. Yeah, thank um, you very yeah, much. Yeah, ischemia is something which I think we see much more in more in Pakistan because I guess we have more mitral stenosis and uh -huh. these younger patients, they fib, I don't know, but uh, um, that, that we see that more common. Uh, in US, you know, a lot of the peripheral work is that there are a lot of diagnostics happening in these elderly patients and they're picking up these disease and, you know, um, and then just start working on them. And um, But over here, um, um, we're missing the diagnostic dedicated peripheral labs. Um, you know, you, you so th that's something which we see now. How often do you treat the inflow? Um, use fix the larger vessels and then bring them back and see if the wound is healing or not before going in below knee. Or for claudication, actually, does help a lot that you fix the inflow, see if the claudication symptoms get better, and then you walk the below knee area and deal with it with aggressive medical therapy. For light threatening ischemia, I guess they want to use both terms chronic limb, light threatening ischemia, CLTI. What says critical limb ischemia? Sometimes it seems like it's acute. You know? um, so the people like to use the CLTI term as well. But for CLTI, um, do you fix all everything regardless, uh, or you wait to fix the inflow first and then go for the outflow below knee disease? Typically, your approach and uh, Asim and others' approach. I think uh, with Tayyip, you there in? as well. Yes, please. Oh. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, the, what uh, nowadays what I am seeing uh, are because most of the patients I get from our uh, endocrinology colleagues. So majority of them are majority, uh, 70 to 80 percent, they are below knee. And uh, the more uh, I'm doing, uh, the better is the result. Although, you know, as Dr. Rambar uh, mentioned, there are more patients who are mixed, atherosclerotic plus, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, they, they have uh, these uh, plots uh, uh, mixed with uh, atherosclerosis. So the more uh, here in shower, what we are doing, uh, we have two center HMC and LRS. They are doing. Uh, the, we both have dedicated, uh, you know, the peripheral um, lab, and uh, uh, most of our work is below knee nowadays. I, I think so, uh, on your question, uh, Noman, that uh, practical uh, uh, considerations are always there, and uh, we really try our best, uh, not as a policy, but as a, I mean, definitely fix the inflow and for, a, a, and really finish whatever 
needs to be done or can be done at, in the same sitting because it's going to be very difficult, expensive, and to otherwise come back again. But many a times, if you have a good flow in the, in the tibials and you fixed uh, the proximal vessels better, then these people can be converted into just uh, uh, you know, asymptomatic PAD and uh, maybe will not uh, use that. But for CLTI, you would like to fix everything that you can and get- no, I, I, Ideally, I guess to prevent uh... As you showed the slide very nicely, where you know the schema reduction results in less amputation as well. Um, yeah, you know, with the labs that you bought, bought, bought the show of dedicated peripheral labs. Um, so I think it's important to, uh, that you know a lot of smaller labs are mushrooming. It'll be hard to do long peripheral cases on those uh, uh, labs that are mushrooming up, and you know should have DSA idly and you know roadmap that you can work on. Uh, in the peripheral cases. I mean, you can use all the other labs to do it as well, but it's good to at least have those uh, features available to get good quality uh, stuff done. Anybody has any experience with CO2? Uh, I mean, I've not seen it in uh, Pakistan as yet, uh, you know, for our renal patients. Anyone has any experience with that? Asim. In Pakistan? Yes. Uh, I don't so, think so. so. No personal experience. Normally, RIs yeah. try to get their hands on anything new that comes yeah. up or pops up. Huh? No, what I've heard is that Shifa probably has this capability, but I've never seen a scan on that. But I okay. believe Shifa International has the capability. Uh, uh, I have seen. We, oh, Tayyab, yes. Are you, are you uh, online as well? Please uh, go ahead. Dr. Tayyab Mahideen is also with us. I, I have seen images on CO2. They're terrible, actually, especially for uh, intrapropletial or below the knee uh, images. You can't see a thing. Um, so generally not recommended for that, yeah. No, not at all. I would say use digital subtraction and use the minimum amount of contrast. Yeah. Uh, I think anything below the knee, digital subtraction is the way to go. And you can just use one cc of contrast and you'll opacify everything. Um, the way to go would be to use a ruler uh, below the knee. So you can mark yeah. your lesions right there. So uh, trust me, it's even difficult to get a good ruler in Pakistan also. Exactly yeah. right. We used to have we this plastic radio peg ruler. We used to stick it on the side of the leg. And that way, you know, that used to be our like roadmap also roadmap, provided yes. good reference. So I haven't been able to find that over here. You know, I've been right. using uh, my Same own here. ruler, kind of, you know, an idea. So this we, is 10 we, centimeters we, putting we, things we, on the side we, of the limb. So... Yeah, we, Imar gave us a very nice ruler, and I don't know, somebody threw it away in the lab. They thought it was <laughs> a waste of time. <laughs> they had these disposable, I, I can't imagine they were expensive. They were actually disposable plastic rulers, which had radio opaque lines. So you just used to paste it on the side of the leg, and that was very helpful throughout the case. So I, I guess we just have to find people to be able to bring that stuff here. But uh, yeah, that's... Uh, Pick it up when you go next time to America. Yeah, yeah, you can get in trouble with those so bringing things, you know. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, I think it was a, a great session. Uh, we're almost at time. And uh, any of the other panelists, uh, you know, we who, who are there, we haven't been able to uh, touch base with. Um, Kazi, you want to make some comments? Uh, I think you're the only one left uh, who hasn't been so comments yet. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I that's a very valid point affordability is a big thing in these cases uh, you know um, uh, wo, wo major issue but uh, uh, i think for the severe claudicans and critical life threatening ischemia wo, uh, you know uh, CLTI ki jo patients and critical wo, unke liye, we can convince our patients uh, you know uh, in, in, in in those cases but again affordability prevents us uh, sometimes from moving forward and on that note, I think it's, uh, as pointed out, um, an area which is uh, definitely ignored and underexplored, and uh, we need to focus on more. And uh, I think we'll have a few more sessions for that uh, with uh, the help of all of you. And uh, thank you again, okay. Professor Amber and all the panelists for joining in. And have a nice weekend. And actually, Eid Mamari to everyone. Uh, sir, uh, just to cut you short, there are two questions from in the uh, question box.
so I saw one. Uh, if anybody wants to quickly take on that question, the one question was actually on the venous disease. That what's the uh, uh, role of uh, interventions uh, in Pakistan on DVT and methionine syndrome? So that was one. And the other is what is supervised exercise uh, exercise role in intermittent claudication in PAD? So who wants to take those questions? Uh, uh, Doctor Amber, you want to take the venous intervention? Uh, I can, uh, uh, yeah, and, and then I think I'll uh, over to ask him also about it because I personally uh, am not doing venous interventions, but uh, some of the interventional radiologists are doing this uh, and uh, they are giving uh, a TPA or streptokinase and then they are stenting the veins as well. So that's so the, what's happening. There are a few well-trained interventional radiologists in Lahore as well, and they've done a few, I know. Uh, and But this is something, this is a huge area actually in which there is uh, this kind of venous intervention yeah. as well as uh, the radiofrequency ablation for varicose veins, which is a different thing from uh, this. But, uh, a, if you want to, that's a very high volume of that. And I think- uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. I think that is well. The varicose veins, that, that's the highest volume of numbers you're doing if you start doing them, you yes. know, the cosmetic you start doing but, that. You know, there's a big jump in the pulmonary embolism patients, which can be a life-saving uh, thing with the you know, larger version of the penumbra catheter yes. for being able to suck the uh, clot out. Uh, I think that's the therapy. If we can get it down uh, over here, that'll be great. But uh, uh, again, yeah, venous intervention, peripheral. I, I think you had some experience in doing venous interventions. I don't know how, how much you're doing over here. Uh, but Tahir uh, Mahyuddin, Dr. Tahir Mahyuddin, are you there? I think he left. Uh, Asim, your thoughts? Uh, 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 yeah. Okay, Jabba. Uh, so, so uh, you see now, DVT is no longer a disease that you need to treat with anticoagulation alone. It's it's something that needs intervention because otherwise post-thrombotic syndrome is a big issue later on. The other thing is May Turner syndrome is an often ignored uh, etiology that we need to look into because the only solution to that permanent solution would be to remove the thrombus and then put a stent in provided you've really confirmed the diagnosis of May Turner syndrome. Uh, we've done a few cases of May Turner at RIC with the help of proctors, but then we've stopped doing it because uh, we don't have the dedicated either stents available in Pakistan. The only ones that we've used are the, uh, carotid, are the uh, wall stents. Uh, but then you don't have the high pressure balloons available to properly uh, deploy the stents and inflate, uh, post dilate those stents. Uh, I'm glad to know that some international radiologists are doing this because this, there's a huge burden of this disease. Uh, I've, I've tried to refer a few patients to international radiologists in Lahore, Karachi, and Islamabad, and those patients were turned down from everywhere because of lack of uh, inventory available and because nobody was actually practically doing it. Yes, they are capable of doing it, but unfortunately, they are not doing it. Uh, that's, that's what my experience has They as give well. appointments. Uh, yeah, the... When we get the inventory, then we'll do it. It'll come next year or whatever and, uh, and so but... on and so forth. But when you do legs, you see people will show up with you with venous disease as well. They will come with venous ulcers. They will come with these and, and because they think that you can fix everything in the leg, right? So, yeah. uh, which in reality, you should be able to. Yeah. Ideally, yes. Um, but yeah, that's what my experience has been that very limited uh, you know, interventions and uh, in, in venous uh, and uh, same response. So the last question is, what is the supervised exercise role in independent claudication? And after that, uh, we'll close. Um, uh, excellent uh, uh, results. And uh, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, un until and unless we're talking about uh, severe claudication, they must all go through an exercise program. Basically, build up your exercise uh, uh, tolerance and uh, just like for cardiac rehab and, uh, and, and, and the claudication will get better. Also, even for patients for whom you have fixed their uh, uh, their uh, their uh, arteries, you should still put them through a walking uh, or a exercise program. So I think it is extremely important to do that. Yeah, that's a must. That has to go along with the yeah. whatever prevention if we plan okay. to do that. that should be tried. absolutely. So with that, we'll end and okay, um, really enjoyed the session and Eid Mubarak to everyone in advance. Uh, so take care. Thank you very much. Eid Mubarak to all. Thank you and Eid Mubarak.